Today I want to share with you essential salts for your prepper pantry and how they are different and which ones are the best. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. I frequently get a lot of questions about which salts are best to use in a traditional foods kitchen. And the questions are very varied from what you should be using in cooking, what you should be using as a finishing salt that you don't use in cooking, and especially I get a lot of questions about what salts are best to use when it comes to making ferments or pickles. Now be sure to open the description under this video because I'll have timestamps there if there's a particular salt you're interested in learning about so you can jump around. And also in the description, you'll see a link to a corresponding blog post that'll go with this video where I'll be discussing these salts as well. Well, let's jump into this discussion about salts and get started. The first place I want to start is over here with the common salts that you can find at your grocery store. If you're at the beginning of your journey from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen, you may be using salts like this right now. And although these are not the best choices when it comes to using salt in a traditional foods kitchen, I understand completely that maybe right now this is what fits in your food budget. And that's especially why I wanted to do this video where I kind of go over the continuum of salts as to what is available as you move along your journey to more of a traditional foods kitchen and your grocery budget changes and you're, and you're able to allot different monies to getting better salts. Now grocery stores have really expanded the selection of salts that you can buy there these days. It's quite different than maybe years ago when all we might be able to find was the typical iodized table salt. Now let's talk about iodized salt for a minute. Why is it iodized? What does iodized mean? And what that means is that they've added, the salt manufacturers have added, or the salt packagers, they're not really manufacturing the salt, but the salt has had iodine added to it. And the reason that this was done was years ago, we didn't have the same selection of foods that are available to us today. Often people, maybe in the United States specifically, living in the Midwest, who didn't have the availability of seafood like we do today all across the United States, may not have been getting enough food with iodine in it, because seafood is very rich in iodine. And what was happening, people were developing something called goiter, which is a condition that you may have seen pictures of this on the internet because it's relatively rare today, where people get look at, they have something that looks like a large large lump in their neck and that's from an enlarged thyroid gland and from having a lack of iodine in one's diet. So even though for most of us our diets are richer in iodine today, you still can buy iodized salt. Now if you want to buy just regular table salt that's not iodized, it'll often just be labeled salt like this one here. Now the drawback about average table salt like this is that it really has limited uses in the traditional foods kitchen. Yes, you can use it to cook with, and yes, you can use it to season food after it's been cooked. Uh, those are definite uses for it. However, typical table salt doesn't make a great companion when you're trying to make ferments, for example, like sauerkraut. And the reason is because salts like this, typical table salt, has anti-caking agents in it. And that's why you hear, you know, when it rains and pours, even though there's moisture in the air, these stay uh, very pourable. And it's the anti-caking agents that keep them like this. However, anti-caking agents can interfere with the fermentation process. Now another drawback about typical table salt, which we're going to talk about when it comes to salts in general, because it does pretty much apply to all salts, is the discussion about something called microplastics. 
Now I just want to take a minute to read to you this definition of what microplastics are. And this is from the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the European Chemicals Agency. And what they say is that microplastics are fragments of any type of plas plastic less than five millimeters in length. So it's very small. And in my corresponding blog post with this video, I'll link to this information as well as some other scientific studies that we're going to talk about in terms of microplastics and their inclusion in these salts. So be sure to check out that blog post for more detailed information. But the bottom line, especially for us home cooks, is why does all of this matter? What is it about microplastics and salt that can be problematic? And the reason is that scientists tell us that these microplastics leach chemicals that are then transferred into the salt and then are not good for our health. And what scientific studies have found is that these type of table salts, whether they're just the standard iodized or non-iodized ones, or ones that are, say, iodized sea salt, or just the plain natural sea salt with no iodine in them, what scientists have found after studying all these salts is that your typical average table salts do contain these microplastics. About 90% of all table salts contain microplastics, which is rather amazing and that certain salts contain much higher levels of microplastics than other salts. And so that's why I wanted to go over all these different salts with you. And I'll also, as I mentioned earlier, be linking to all the scientific studies in the corresponding blog post that show you which salts have the higher percentages of microplastics compared to those salts which have the lower percentages of microplastics. Now, as we discuss these different salts and which are best for our prepper pantry, I want to mention that if you are new on this journey, and even if you're not new, but primarily if you are new on this journey from moving from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen, you may find my free, it's totally free, 36 page pantry list very helpful. In that list, I discuss what you basically need in a traditional foods kitchen. And it's not just a list. I also have links to all types of videos and printable recipes that show you how to use these foods as you begin to incorporate them into your kitchen. So be sure to open the description under this video because I'll have a link that'll take you over to my website where you can download that list. And something that I want to mention, especially for those of you who are on this journey, maybe at the beginning of this journey, moving from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen, I don't want you to stress about any of this. If you're using this salt for now, that's fine. If that's what's in your budget, I always say stay in your budget because going out of your budget just causes stress and stress is never good for our health. So I don't want you to worry. I don't want you to feel stressed. I don't want you to feel you have to buy everything in one fell swoop. And I don't want you to rush because the road to success is paved with patience. You have to do this little by little in terms of moving on this journey from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen. Incorporating these things little by little means that you will be successful. And it may take a year or two, but at the end of that journey, you're going to find that you have a relatively smooth running traditional foods kitchen. Now, is it gonna be perfect? No, because I always say nothing is perfect, but you're going to be farther along on your journey than you were when you started. As, and as long as you go slow and take it step by step, you won't get frustrated and you won't get discouraged and you will find that you will be successful in making that transition from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen. So these are your table salts that you may be using right now. Now what about kosher salts? You hear a lot about kosher salt and how chefs really like kosher salt. Kosher salt has a little bit of a more coarser texture and as it says right here, coarse kosher salt. And generally, even whether it says coarse or doesn't say coarse, kosher salt does tend to have a little bit more of a coarse texture than just the plain table salts. 
And often you'll hear chefs say that they find that it has a pure taste, uh, a finer taste, so on and so forth. But what I have found lately that is so fascinating to me is that I used to think all kosher salts were basically created equal. But that's not the case. This particular brand contains anti-caking agents, which surprised me because I didn't think that kosher salt did contain those. So it really doesn't come in a lot different than this table salt that also contains anti-caking agents. Then, I found this kosher salt at my grocery store, which is just my, as you all know, I live in Central Texas and I shop at HEB a lot. And this was just the kosher salt. It's a little less expensive than the name brand. And this is the one that, as I said, is sold at my grocery store. And I was very surprised to read that all this kosher salt contains is salt. And in the case of this particular description, they're saying that this is a sea salt. Now, technically, whether salt is from dried seawater or in the case of things like the real salt that is mined from ancient salt beds, it's basically all at one time was sea salt. But in any event, this particular kosher sea salt at my grocery store is from Italy. It says it's the product of Italy. And what's very interesting about that is when you read these studies about the microplastics, it seems to be that salt uh, dried from the seas in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic Oceans have less microplastics than uh, salts dried from uh, the Pacific Ocean. And the scientific studies explain why this is the case. There are sort of large garbage barges that are in the Pacific Ocean and they believe they're leaching more uh, into the salt water and so on and so forth. But in any event, I think that if I was looking at, for kosher salts, I would definitely look at what my grocery store brand was selling as opposed to the name brand. Because I was a little disappointed that this did contain uh, an anti-caking agent, which, which doesn't make it as useful to me in a traditional foods kitchen. Now, what about canning and pickling salt? Now, I have a video where I go into a lot of detail. I actually have a whole playlist all about water bath canning, and it's definitely geared to beginners, and I walk you through all the different equipment that you're going to need, as well as all the various salts and other uh, accoutrements that you may need to add to your um, canned goods when you go to what, and it's all about water bath canning, which I think is a very good entree for beginners into canning. And canning and pickling salt is one of the salts that you need when you water bath can certain things. And what's interesting about canning and pickling salt, as opposed to this particular kosher salt, but made by the same company, is that as I mentioned, this one has anti-caking agents, this one does not. The ingredients on this is simply salt. And that's what you want to look for when you're water bath canning something, for example, say pickles, that you're going to be using salt with. You want to make sure that when you water bath can, you use something that just says salt. Because just like how anti-caking agents can interfere with the fermentation process when you're fermenting vegetables, anti-caking agents and other additives can interfere with the water bath canning process. And I'll be sure to link to that water bath canning playlist in the iCards and in the description below, especially now that we're going into the warmer months and our gardens are starting to grow and we're going to be maybe doing more canning as we go through harvest season. Uh, I, that's a really great uh, place to start, as I said, water bath canning. And as I said, I'll link in the iCards and in the description below so you can go through that playlist if water bath canning is something that you want to learn more about. And not only when it comes to water bath canning, those of us who do run a traditional foods kitchen are gonna be doing a lot more fermenting as we go through the growing and the harvest season. And that's another reason that I wanted to talk about the different types of salts, because it is very important that you use the right type of salt, especially when you're making ferments. 
because vegetable ferments, like all kinds of ferments, no matter what you're fermenting, can be very persnickety. And the more you can use things like filtered water and the right type of salt, the better chances you are going to have of, of having success with your ferment. And I have a whole playlist all about ferments, uh, and I'll be sure to link to that in the iCards and in the description below. And I have a playlist that specifically focuses on vegetable ferments, which will be very appropriate to the seasons that we're going into now. Next, what I want to talk about are these uh, tubes of salt that are both labeled sea salt. One is coarse crystals and one is fine crystals. And you've probably seen ones that are similar uh, if you're not shopping at HEB, uh, but you've probably seen ones similar to this that are maybe the brand names at your local grocery store that have a blue and, re a blue and red tube very similar to this, or maybe your own store has their store brands of it. And these are interesting uh, because, you know, the term terminology sea salt can be very, very generic and there's definitely different levels of quality when it comes to things that say sea salt. But what's nice about this particular store brand, similar to the kosher salt store, store brand that I have here, is that these are harvested off the coast of Spain. And so again, you're dealing with Mediterranean waters, which as I mentioned, that sea salt from the Mediterranean are often, although not perfect, are often found to have uh, lower levels of those microplastics. And these, at least at my grocery store, are very affordable, uh, both the store-bought brand as well as uh, the name brand. And so it, as you're moving up the continuum, so to speak, of the salt, the, the salt continuum, and you want to get away from using just regular table salt, and you're not particularly interested in having a kosher salt that has um, anti-caking agents, you can look for what uh, other types of kosher salt your store might sell, or you may want to look for the sea salts like this that your store might sell that are collected from Mediterranean waters. Now moving into this collection of salts, we're really starting to get into what I think of as like the, the more fancy <laughs> sea salts, uh, but these are really uh, high quality sea salts. Now they do run the gamut in price. Um, some I really buy in bulk because the cost savings is terrific. I've talked about in a lot of my pantry videos, my prepper pantry videos about buying things in bulk. And salt is a great thing to buy in bulk uh, because it does bring down the price and it's basically a forever food. It lasts forever, so you don't need to worry about it. Uh, but in any event, they do kind of run the gamut in price and they also run the gamut in quality and microplastics. So let's talk about that. Now what I've got over here are two types of Himalayan sea salt and they're basically mined from the Himalayan mountains. And I know many of you have talked to me about this and said that you like using this pink Himalayan sea salt and wanted to learn more about it. Now, this is a very nice uh, bottle. It's a glass bottle and it has a ceramic grinder. And what's nice about that, if you look for these smaller amounts of Himalayan sea salt that are in the, in the coarse uh, state here, is a ceramic grinder is less likely to be corroded by the salt. Now, this particular brand, and both of these I bought uh, from my local grocery store. This is plastic and it doesn't mention anything about the grinder. It just says grinder. So I'm not sh sure how well this would hold up. However, when it comes to Himalayan pink salt, the, interestingly enough, the microplastics found in it were a little higher than some of the other salts. Now, when I say a little higher in microplastics, it's all relative. I'm talking about a little higher sort of from this part of the continuum down. These all tend to uh, be definitely on the higher side. But of your better salts, if we want to refer to them that way, the Himalayan pink salt did have a higher percentage. It was found in these studies, which I'll definitely link to for you so that you can read more about this, had a higher percentage of microplastics than these other salts. I found that fascinating since this is basically a mined salt. 
but I did find that that was something that I wanted to share with you if this is a salt that you like to use. The good news is it's just salt and there's no anti-caking agents in, in salts like this and it is very high in minerals. Now the other thing you want to keep in mind is if you do need iodine in your diet, these salts are generally not a high source of iodine. But chances are, unless you have goiter or you've had blood tests from your doctor that show that you have low iodine, most likely most of us do get enough iodine in our diet, so we may not necessarily need to worry about the amount of iodine or lack of the amount of iodine we're getting from our salt. Now as we move down this continuum, I just want to take a minute to talk about the salt I have here in this box because there are so many salts available to us, many more than I'm showing here, but most of them are gourmet salts and salts that I don't consider necessarily something that we're gonna be stocking in our prepper pantries uh, in the typical traditional foods working kitchen. They're certainly nice to have, but they can often be expensive. And sometimes they have a very specific taste profile that don't make them uh, sort of universally useful through all of your cooking needs. So you may even see at your grocery store, or even if you go online, this huge variety of gourmet salts. And there's even a black salt that comes from Hawaii that has some volcanic ash in it. But generally what I do is keep one or two of these sort of fancy salts on hand that generally are, like in the case of this one, the Maldon, it's sea salt, and it's got little, it almost looks like little flakes. And what's fun about these is they can be very nice finishing salts. So if you're putting together maybe a little charcuterie platter, or an appetizer platter, and you want to have a little salt in a, in a little bowl, then you can uh, use that salt to kind of sprinkle as a finishing salt on whatever you may be serving, or your guests can sprinkle it on their individual crackers or whatever the case may be. And so these are very tasty and they also look very lovely. Uh, however, in terms of the microplastics, it's very difficult to know specifically unless these specific gourmet salts have been tested because there's such a wide variety of them. So when looking for salts like this, maybe looking for ones that are uh, harvested from the Mediterranean or the Atlantic may help you feel a little more reassured that maybe the microplastics in that particular salt are lower. Now let's talk about some of my favorite everyday salts. And those include the Celtic Grey Sea Salt and the real salt, which I have to thank all of you for introducing me to. Now the Celtic gray salt is actually harvested from the sea off the coast of France. And the Redmond real salt is harvested actually from an ancient seabed, but it's mined in the mountains of Utah. Now when it comes to the Celtic gray sea salt, they have a coarse variety and they have a fine variety and then they have something called fleur de sel, or as it says right on top of your flower of the ocean. Now I have really been successful using the coarse ground Celtic sea salt when I make my ferments, but you can also use the fine ground Celtic sea salt as well. And basically what the fine ground is, is simply the coarse Celtic gray sea salt that's been ground into a fine ground salt, which makes it very easy to use in sprinkling on top of different dishes after you've cooked, or even just the ease of measuring when you're cooking, if you have a recipe that may call for a half a teaspoon of salt or a teaspoon of salt, whatever the case may be, because most recipes are assuming that you're using a fine ground sea salt or just a fine ground salt in general. Now fleur de sel or a flower of the sea or flower of the ocean is considered a finishing salt. It's not a salt that you're supposed to necessarily cook with because it's supposed to leave a very nice taste on your tongue and things like that, so on and so forth. And it's harvested in a different way than the traditional Celtic gray sea salt. It's the, wa the sea water is brought into a particular area and then it's allowed to dry and 
on the very, very top, there are like, there's this sort of fine layer of crystals that are formed, and that's the fleur de sel. And then the uh, salt harvesters will just gently remove that off the top, and then that is what becomes your fleur de sel. Now let's talk about the Redmond Real Salt, and then we're going to talk about microplastics. Now, as I mentioned, this comes from an ancient seabed, and so this salt is mined. And this salt also comes in a fine ground variety, as well as a coarse ground variety. And I look forward to trying the coarse ground. I'm going to start first trying the coarse ground in my ferments to see if it's sort of the equivalent of the Celtic uh, gray coarse ground. And we'll see how things go, and I'll definitely be reporting back to you about that. And then they've also got this fine ground that I have started using in my cooking. And something I need to say about this, as well as as a finishing salt, you know, if we want to add a little salt onto something uh, that we're eating, it works very, the fine ground works very well for that. And the taste, I will say, is quite lovely. I highly recommend it. So now what did the scientists find when they studied the Redmond Real Salt and the Celtic Grey Sea Salt for microplastics. And what they found was that both of these came in very low on the scale for containing any microplastics. So that was very reassuring. However, there was one exception. It seems as though fleur de sel may be a little higher in microplastics than the regular Celtic Grey Sea Salt. So, being concerned about that, fleur de sel may be something that we don't want to rush to using. Now, although not significantly higher in microplastics, if that's something that we're concerned about in our traditional foods kitchen, it may be something that we don't want to use or want to limit our use. And when you read various blog posts and articles that people write about different types of salt, after reviewing these various scientific studies, most of them find at the end of their research that they recommend the Redmond Real Salt the most. Now, this is not a sponsored post for any of these salts, not the Celtic Grey, not the Redmond. It's simply information that I learned on my own personal journey in learning more about salts and more about microplastics. And I really have to thank many of you because you wrote to me either in emails or in comments asking me to research this and to learn more because you were also concerned. So I think as you move on your journey from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen and you want to incorporate some better forms of salt into your cooking, then really looking to the Celtic Grey Sea Salt or the Redmond Real Salt are going to be very good options. Now, if you'd like to learn more about how to best stock your traditional foods prepper pantry, be sure to click on this video over here where I have a playlist that goes over all the different types of foods for the traditional foods kitchen, including which sweeteners are best and which grains are best, as well as lots more. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.